talk about missions. Why? Why do we go on missions? When do we go on missions? And where do we go on missions? So tonight I want to hop in and talk about the why. You know? Why do we go on missions? I'm glad you asked. And there is an answer in the list, God. Let's look at it. Why are we going on missions? Excuse me, we are commanded to go on missions, believe it or not. It's not just something we do because it's nice or we just want to get away, take a vacation. Um, some of the country is beautiful here in South Africa. Our focus is not about vacation. We got a little r and &R before we launched the VBS Vacation Bible School today, just so we could get acclimated and settled in. Yeah. But our focus is on souls. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28. We read from verse 16 to 20. Hope you got your Bible. If you don't, grab it, pull it up on your phone or wherever you can. I um, oftentimes, oh, you know what? We didn't check. Do we have any new people in the class tonight? If anybody's new, put, hit that reaction button so you can raise your hand so we can see. Is there anybody that's new tonight? Not seeing anybody. Hit, hit reaction, hit raise your hand if you are. If not, then welcome everybody. Um, in addition, to acknowledge and any new people should we have had and we want to acknowledge everybody wherever you are whether you put your shout out in the chat about where you're joining us from or not we appreciate you hopping on and we enjoy fellowshipping and over the word with you so let's look at matthew 28 16. as i was saying you know sometimes we have put the scripture up on the screen but a lot of times I don't. And I got away from it primarily for the fact that I want to challenge you to get your Bible. I want you to hold a Bible in your hand and read it for yourself. I have found on many, many occasions as I sit to hear a word taught or preach, what I think I've come to hear may not be all that God has for me. Because in my meditation and in my reading of the scripture for myself, God will speak to me something that maybe the teacher or preacher didn't even have in mind. So I want you to get in the habit when you go to church, you go to Bible study, take your Bible with you. Let God speak to you individually as well as he speaks to us all collectively. Okay. Matthew 28, 16 says, Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had accorded for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, I need you to understand the context of this scripture. It's talking about after Jesus had risen from the dead, he had been buried for three days and three nights as he predicted, <clears throat> and then he rose from the dead. Just like he said he would. So he told them to go ahead and meet him. So here they are waiting for him to arrive. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I don't have time to unpack that, but just know that everybody that's hanging out in the presence of the Lord may or may not be putting their full faith in him. People coming to church still doubting who God is, whether he'll do what he said he'll do. Um, and I suppose all of us have been there and done that. But faith comes how? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. I got to drive that doubt out by continually pouring in the word of God so that I can believe God for what he said he would do and for who he said he is. Let's keep it moving. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Somebody underline that in their Bible. All the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So basically, this is the last directive Jesus gave before he ascended back to heaven. So what does he tell us to do? He says, go and make disciples. You know, that's why First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, our mission and vision statement, statement says we are called and commissioned and we are walking in the uh, object or objective to make dynamic disciples through discipleship, discipline, and duplication. That's what we do. That's who we've been called to be. And that's based on what this scripture is telling us. It doesn't say necessarily that uh, disciples just happen just because people hang around the church. Notice that it says make disciples. That's an action word. That's an imperative. It's telling us is we have to do something, right? We have to be intentional about making disciples. Sometimes we say, oh, but they'll just know I'm a Christian by the way I live. And that's beautiful. But that doesn't necessarily make me a disciple because I know how you live. You need to train me in righteousness. Teach me in God's way. As you model Christ's likeness, that's a part of it, but it's not the whole picture. So we're talking about the why of mission. <clears throat> because Jesus said, what? Go make disciples. Bottom line is, we do it because he said so. How many ever had one of the mothers that you asked too many questions and they say, because I said so. Why I got to do this? Why I got to do that? Because I said so. At some point, they're going to stop explaining and just say, do what I said. God's word is filled from Genesis to Revelation with the same premise over and over. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to redeem mankind by the precious blood of the lamb. He modeled it in the Old Testament through the slaughtering of animals and then he manifested it in the New Testament by surrendering his very own life to be a ransom for many. So when we come to Christ, we come because he went to make disciples. In other words, we are his prototypes. We are his children. We are his disciples. A disciple is a learner. And we learn the ways of those who disciple us. We learn the ways of Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve, to seek and to save that which was lost. If that was his modus operandi, if that was his purpose, his focus, and we say we're his disciples, then surely that should be ours. You know, if you talk to psychologists, they'll tell you who they follow. Or oh, I'm a Freudian, or I believe in Erickson's theories. Who do you follow? Your practices should reflect the fact that you say I'm a child of God. Your actions should reflect that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I do what he did. I am Christ's ambassador, the word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5. I have a job to do. What is an ambassador do? He represents the one who sent him. We represent the kingdom of God. And so Jesus told us to go. We go because he said so. Bottom line. I want you to remember this. How many know what this means? Great commission. You familiar with that term? Anybody? Let me see your hand if you know what that is. Great commission. Okay, that's fine. I want to point this out because this is commonly what we refer to as the Great Commission. Though the word commission is not used in it, it is the commissioning of the saints. It is the, the directive of God to his church. He gave a great commission. The biggest assignment before he left was to go make disciples. He told us to do what? Not just baptize them, he said, but teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So if we're going to make disciples, we got to know for ourselves, first of all, what did he command, right? And then we teach others what he commanded. Then we make sure they're baptized. 
in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice it doesn't say the names. It's not a plural because they are one. All the deity, all the fullness of the Godhead lives in Christ. Oh, that's not our teaching tonight. But the key thing is we baptize in that name. And so when we talk about the Great Commission, this is what we're talking about. God commissioned the saints, the people of God, the followers of Jesus Christ to go make disciples. Notice this. It is not the great suggestion. Can I get an amen? Some people treat it like, oh, if we get around to it, that sounds nice. Or, well, that ain't what I'm called to. That's what those people are called to. I'm not that deep. Well, either you're a child of God who's a disciple of Christ or you're not. You can't be partly, kind of like being partly pregnant. Ain't no such thing. You either are or you ain't. And if you are, then guess what? You've been commissioned to go make disciples, right? It's not just for the select few. It's for every blood or believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we're called to do. Amen? It's not as some like to relegate it. Oh, that's for the, you know, the ministers or the evangelists or for the, you know, super saints. No, this is for anybody who names the name of Jesus. He was talking to his disciples. Go back and read this in context. He wasn't talking to just any old body. He was talking to the people who say they follow him. And this was more than just Matthew and Mark and Luke. I mean, I'm sorry. But it's more than just those who were right there with him. This word applies to each of us who say we belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's see here. Let us keep it moving. Might be why everything was blurry, at least in part. And y'all pray for my roommate, Yolanda. She's a trooper. Poor baby. She's been hanging up in here with me. I said, I'm so sorry. I'd have kept her awake. Probably it wasn't my fault. The heat wouldn't come on. We are in uh, a section that, well, throughout the country of South Africa, they have um, cycles where they cut the electricity off for two hours. And they are in essence trying to uh, take pressure off of their power grid. So in this particular region that we're in, it typically goes off around 8, 8.30, come back on 10, 10.30. Sometimes it goes off at different times. You know, they'll give them a schedule. We were down near the beach the other day and it was during their time for the BR. So it's it's in cycles. It was funny, but we were saying, Yolanda was saying, what if you leave one area and the lights are off and then you go to another area and it's their turn. So you could be out all day long <laughs> with no lights. But that, at least for us in America, is a wake up call. We need to take care of the resources that we have Heaven forbid that we find ourselves in this place. And we need to be grateful for the resources. If you live in a place where your lights stay on all the time, if you want them on, you need to say, thank you, Jesus. We were talking to a gentleman who was a part of this organization that we're partnering with called Orchid Africa. And they empower local people to help them build gardens so they can grow their own food, build churches, build preschools. They partner with churches to do whatever is needed to support the community. They, tomorrow we'll go to community um, homes where we'll take toiletries and food and pray for people. They come alongside the churches and the pastors to help do whatever it is the community needs done. And he was telling us that they came awfully close last year to running out of water. He said they were literally at a place where they thought, and they were rationing, he said, we were putting buckets out to get rainwater because that's how difficult things had got. I said, Lord, we take so much for granted. 
we need to be grateful for whatever we have. Amen. All right, let me get back on my topic. So we go because God commissioned us to go. Let's look at what that means, commission. There's really only one scripture in the Bible that speaks of the word commission, although the principles, it's like the word trinity does not exist in the Bible, but the principle exists. When we look at that, this is Paul, when he was commissioned before he became Paul, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. And his job at the time was to run around. He was a Pharisee. He didn't believe in Jesus Christ. He thought that the people of God were cultic and they were blaspheming and elevating Jesus to be before God. And he took it as his assignment to kill them all. I mean, no, you didn't want to visit from Saul. In chapter 26 of Acts, it says, while thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Um, let me back up. Verse 9 says, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. It was him standing there when Stephen was stoned to death, holding everybody's coats and giving them proof. Verse 11, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to, be, to blaspheme and been exceedingly enraged against them persecuted them even to foreign cities. So he left Jerusalem chasing people. They like a bounty hunter. You know, much like when slaves would run away in America, they had slave catchers that would go all over the United States looking to try to catch them and take them back to what they thought was their rightful masters. Of course, no human being can own another. But he went around trying to catch people and punish them persecute them. And that's why verse 12 says, while thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. So he had a letter that authorized him to go around persecuting the church on behalf of the quote unquote church. So the commission then was, notice how it said a couple of verses before that I received authority. So when I'm commissioned, I have been put in posture where I have permission and I have power or authority to act and to do whatever has been given me to do. You know, sometimes we think of commissioning a ship, you know, when they put a ship out to sea, the USS Arizona or whatever, they commission it to go out and achieve the task for which it was created. You are commissioned by God to go and make disciples. That means you have permission and power. You have authority to go. You have purpose to go. You have been directed and commanded to go. They don't commission the USS Arizona and then say, hey, just chill out right here in the dock and just rock. Hey, we good with that. No, we spend millions of dollars on that submarine, warship, whatever it might be. We expect that thing to get out there and get busy. How about God spent his precious blood on you? How about he paid for it with the highest price imaginable, his life, so that you could then go forward and do what he called you to do? He didn't call you to sit on a dock and rest. Come on, somebody. He didn't call you to sit back and watch other ships go out. Oh, I'm the USS Arizona. I'm just chilling. I'm watching the USS Plachette go. I, I see the USS uh, Veronica shipping out. I see, no, no, no. He called you to go. G-O. How many know there's three letters in God? What's the first two? Go. Amen. God has been going since the beginning, seeking people. He came when the Israelites cried out, in the wilderness. He showed up in Egypt. He showed up in, with Abraham even before that. And he sent Abraham. 
God has been in the business of sending people from the very beginning of time. So we shouldn't think it's strange, but we have been commissioned. We have been given directive, permission, power, and authority. So what else does it mean? It means to give over. So I've commissioned you. I've set you apart, so to speak. I've given you over to that cause. And it also means continuous. The, the word itself, the, the way it's used in this text, it implies it's a continual action. So it's not a one-time make disciple thing. It means that God expects us to continue to go and to continue to make disciples. Amen. All right. So what does it mean in some? You are given permission and power to make disciples continually. Somebody need to write that down. I even say it to yourself. I am given permission and power to make disciples continuously. Not a one-time deal, but God wants this to be an ongoing part of my life. It's not my first mission. Been overseas many times, different places. And the reason I do it is because God has commanded me to go. And we're going to talk about it more when we get into the what. But tonight we're focused on the why. Okay. Everybody got that? Hope so. All right, let's look at it. It's our purpose. Look at John chapter 20, verse 21. The very reason the church exists is not so we can walk around feeling good about ourselves, not so we can have warm and fuzzy feelings because the Holy Spirit abides in us. No, we have a purpose that God set us apart for because he could have raptured us out of here a long time ago if it was just to be saved. He didn't have to wait, but he has a purpose for us. Chapter 20 of John, Saint, Book of St. John, verse 21. I'm reading New King James Version. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. Again, this is after he has risen from the dead. As the Father has sent me, I also what send you tell yourself he is sending me god sent me we often want god to show up but how about this he sent you never stop to think about that we want the pastor to come by he sent you he sent you god sent Jesus, Jesus sent you. What did Jesus do when he, when he was in the earth? He went preaching and teaching the kingdom of God, healed the sick, raised the dead, opened blind eyes. Your commission, your calling, your purpose is to do what he did. He said, I, as God, my father sent me, I'm sending you. All right, so when we as the church come together collectively to get empowered by hearing a collective word, our goal, our purpose then should be to go forward from there, making disciples in our trip, wherever we go. He called us to be his witnesses. Look at Acts, should be just a page or so away from Acts chapter one. Because John is the book right before Acts. And we're going to look at verse number eight. You with me? Acts chapter one, verse number eight. Watch this. But you shall receive power, dunamis, that is, in the Greek, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's break that down. First of all, 
I'm going to give you power. I'm not sending you out powerless. I mean, no, God would not send me somewhere that he hadn't equipped me to go. So if he said, I'm sending you, that means he's giving you everything you need to be effective in doing what he's called you to do. And what did he call you to do? Go make disciples. Teach them everything I've taught you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How am I going to do that, God? I'm empowering you with my Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is God. He takes residence on the inside of you the moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The moment you say yes to the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. So you literally have the same power that resided on the inside of Christ Jesus living on the inside of you. So he can feel confident in saying the same way my father sent me, I'm sending you. Because lo, I want us to miss that in, in Matthew 28. Lo, depending on which version we'll read. But let's go back. Show your finger right there in Acts 1. And go back to 28. I don't know if I emphasized it enough. I want to make sure we don't miss it. Because this is a critical part of the going. This is what gives me the confidence to go. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That means as long as there's humankind on the earth realm, Jesus will be with us. Jesus said, I'm sending my spirit. He will not only be with you, but he will abide in you. That means the Holy Spirit will dwell on the inside of you. He will empower you. He will lead you into all truth. He will teach you those things that Jesus taught and bring to our remembrance those things that Jesus taught, teaching us to walk in his way. God's spirit leads you and guides you as you learn to yield to him. But the key I didn't want us to miss is Jesus said, I'll be with you. I'm not sending you somewhere. I'm like Moses. God, these people you done gave me. <laughs> he said, don't send me if you ain't going with us. You know, God had gotten sick of them folks complaining and whining and all that coming out of Egypt. He said, well, why don't I just destroy them and start all over again? <laughs> and Moses said, you can't do that. You kill all these people, they're going to stay there. God that they served brought them out of bondage, but he couldn't take them to the promised land, so he killed them. God, your name is on the line. You can't do that. That's the kind of prayer you got to learn how to pray, talk with God, reason with God. But anyway, that's a whole nother issue. The point is, he's with us, just like he was with them. He was a pillar of fire, a pillar at night and a fire that led them. God always is with you. I need you to tell yourself that. God always is with me. I don't care what I'm going through. God always is with me. I don't care how difficult my day is. God always is with me. People getting on my nerve, worried about my job, can't figure out my financial situation. Guess what? God is always with me. I don't care what happens. Why is that so critical to know? Think about the disciples on the boat. He used to go across to the other side while I go up here and pray for a while. And then this third watch of the night, that's in like three in the morning, we think somewhere in that range, three to six, he comes strolling across the water. <laughs> And he asked Peter, I mean, Peter got scared. Is that you? If it is, bid me come. Of course, he stepped out and he began to sink. And we know he got his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the storm. But the key is, he cried out to God. God was right there. Jesus grabbed him and said, saying to me, right in that moment, God is always with you. Or in another instance where he told him to go across and the storm was raging and winds were blowing. And he was in the bottom of the boat sleep. They went down there and said, don't you care if we perish? He looked at them and rebuked them. You of little faith. Why would he rebuke them? The winds are blowing. The water's coming in the boat. Because I was with you. You think I'm going to let you drown? 
I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You got to remember that when stuff gets tight, God is with me. He ain't going to let me go out like that. I trust the God that I serve. I put my eye on him, the author and the finish of my faith. He is with me. So likewise, in Acts chapter one, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the spirit of God, my spirit is now going to live on the inside of you and I want you to be a witness. No way he says Jerusalem. That's where they lived. They were in Jerusalem in the upper room waiting for him to pour out his spirit when he ascended. They waited in the upper room. The word of God says there was at least a hundred of them up there and they all spoke in tongues. That would include Mother Mary. He was a Bible believing token. You know, despite some of the stuff we might see from splinters of people that came away and started doing other things, Mary spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost along with everybody else. So what's the point? I want you to be my witnesses right there in Jerusalem. Then, and rather in all Judea. So now we're talking about that area around it. So I'm talking Jerusalem. Where is your Jerusalem? What city do you live in? That's your Jerusalem. Notice that Acts goes hand in hand with the commission that he gave us in Matthew 28. Go make disciples of all men, not just the ones that's way across the world, but the ones right there in your neighborhood. Start right there in Jerusalem, in your own household, for goodness sake, if you can, pray and ask the Holy Spirit, because the worst, not worst, some of the most difficult people you'll have to lead to Christ are probably in your own household. Jesus said a man is not without dishonest except in his own household. In other words, the people who know you, ain't that Mary's boy? That's just a cop in the sun. He ain't nobody special. He went home and could do no miracles there because they didn't have any faith in him. They too familiar. People that know you, oh, I remember you messed up. I remember you did this. But that was before Jesus took a hold of me, baby. Don't, don't worry about what I did before. And even if I mess up afterward, because the power is not mine, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the God I serve. And therefore, don't look at me as though I have to be perfect. Yes, I should be striving toward doing the things I can do to be pleasing to the Lord, dying to myself daily. I should be better today than I was yesterday. But I won't reach perfection until I'm home in glory. So if you're waiting for that, you ain't going to never believe anything I say. God made it such that we have these imperfect vessels that the all-surpassing power would be clearly from him. You know it's not you, because you ain't that smart. You ain't that powerful by yourself. It's God's power operating on the inside of you that makes you a powerful witness. So I can be a witness in Jerusalem right here. I can be a witness in Judea. That's the whole region around Jerusalem. In Samaria, that's next door. The closest place. Remember, he walked through Samaria. Met the lady at the well. I'm a good Samaritan walking along the road. So these are, if you lived in the DMV, you might be looking at Virginia and DC as your Samaria if you live in Maryland and vice versa. And then to where? The end of the earth. So that means everywhere is covered under the scripture. I want you to be my witnesses not just in your own city, but in your own region. And I want you to be witnesses in the nearby areas. If I'm in one part of Japan, my nearby region might be, you know, whatever the next big city is. But the point is, ultimately, I want you to be my witnesses to the end of the earth. So it's not one or the other, it's and, both, all right? So these are the why, why we go out, why we share the gospel, why we tell people about the Lord, not just in our neighborhood, but across the world. Why would I spend 
thousands of dollars to fly somewhere. I'm not getting paid to go there. How much is your soul worth? How much is your soul worth? How much is it worth to keep you from going to hell? I think my soul is worth whatever it takes. Because I don't want to go to hell. And I believe God believes every soul is worth whatever it takes. Amen. So let's look at it. We see this lived out in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. We looked at 1 and 8. Now let's look at 8 and 1. It says, now Saul, remember I told you Paul before he became Paul, was Paul Saul. He had a commission from the high priest to go around tormenting the church. Saul was consenting to his death. They're talking about, if you go back and read in chapter 7, the death of Stephen. So one time in the scripture that we see Jesus went from sitting at the right hand of the Father to standing. That's a whole nother sermon. But the bottom line is, he was giving consent to them stoning Stephen, this righteous man to death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. You know, there's been a great deal of persecution of the church after Jesus ascended because, you know, as he said, that they hate me, they're going to hate you. And the Jews were always threatened by him and thought he was blaspheming because he declared himself to be the son of God. So they did all they could. Most did all they could to uphold what they called the way, the sect, some would call it, the church of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus Christ. And so they persecuted, you know, they beheaded some of them and put some in prison, as we show in chapter seven, stoned Stephen to death. What was his crime? He believed in Jesus Christ. And so they went from Jerusalem to now they're in that nearby region of, of that bigger region, Judea. Now they're in the nearby area of Samaria. So the gospel is starting to be sent out. When God allowed this to happen, Sometimes he will permit things to happen that are discomforting for us to affect his purpose. In other words, he's not doing something to hurt you, but he'll use everything in your life to perfect you. So in this instance, where the enemy meant evil, he worked it for good. The enemy meant to destroy the church but what, it, what the enemy ended up doing was dispersing the church so that they went from just Jerusalem to all over the world. It forced them out of their comfort zone. It forced them to have to leave Jerusalem to get the gospel beyond Jerusalem. Some of us ain't going to move until God forces us. So he makes it so uncomfortable for us to sit on what God has put in us. And that may mean many different ways that it may manifest for us. But the point is, he will get his purpose achieved one way or the other. And in this instance, he told them, I want you to be my witness. But they all breaking bread and having a good time and going from house to house. They just enjoying each other. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But that's not it. That's not the whole picture. That's not all I commissioned you to do. I see I'm going to have to allow some things to shake you up, get you out of your comfort zone. We got Jerusalem covered. Now I need you to cover the rest of the place that I've identified and ordained. So here God is allowing them to be pushed out, so to speak, into Judea, into Samaria. And as you continue to read the books, actually you'll see they begin to spread out all over the world. Okay. But let's look further here, even in this chapter, and we'll see another example of how God manifests. In verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem. And I might make note 
This is one of those times I said, man, God, you was a bad, bad, bad boy. Obviously, I mean that with no disrespect. But I mean, in a sense that it amazes me how God utilizes everything, every resource to get his purpose achieved. If you go back and you read earlier, you'll see how Philip was preaching so tough. He was preaching a word hundreds of thousands were getting saved. He casting out demons. He he slaying in the spirit. Philip was a bad boy. And then just like that, leave the revival, Philip. Go, I got somebody I want to talk to, I want you to talk to. It always amazes me how God does things. You know, in our mind, we like, well, why would I leave the multitude to just go talk to one? Just send somebody else. No, I ordain you, Philip, to go talk to that one. I will snatch you from the multitudes because that's how important that one is. Aren't you glad that God thought you were important enough that he would interrupt somebody's uh, program to make sure you heard the good news of the gospel? Got me all the way over here in South Africa going on two o'clock in the morning just to make sure <laughs> that you hear what God wants you to hear. God will interrupt somebody's program. So let me go back. Verse 26. An angel of the Lord, Gina, <laughs> spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he didn't send them nowhere fancy, somewhere, you know, oh, I want to go to Vegas. No, he sent them to the desert. Sent him. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a unit of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. So this is a man that had a heart toward God, even though he was all the way in Ethiopia, in Africa. So he was returning from worship in, in Jerusalem, verse 28. And sitting in his chair, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. I wish I had time to unpack all this, but let me just say this. Don't miss the fact that the angel spoke to Philip. Now the Holy Spirit is guiding him. It is those who are led by the spirit. These are the sons of God. That's what the word of God says. He had a heart so sensitive. He wasn't so caught up in, ooh, I'm, I'm having a wonderful revival. Everybody going to know my name. They're going to be preaching. Talking about, look how tough evangelist Philip is. No, his heart was sensitive. He would willingly leave that great outpouring and go speak to that one person because he was led by the Holy Ghost. Verse 29. I'm sorry, 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Why do we go? We want to give understanding to those who don't know God. We want to let them know what the word of God says and what it means. Here this man was reading it, but he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. How can we understand unless somebody take the time to explain and teach us the ways of God? Just like somebody has done for us, we now are charged to do for someone else. Verse 32. Well, second half of 31. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Of course, we know that was a prophetic word spoken through the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before the prophet. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone other, some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. Beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me? from being baptized. 
one virgin says, why shouldn't I be baptized? In other words, I now understand who Jesus is. I understand that he has told you to go make disciples. I understand that he said baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I see some water right there. Shouldn't we do this thing? Shouldn't I get baptized? Why? What's stopping us? What's hindering us? He understood the God. That's why we don't baptize babies. They can't articulate. I'm ready. I understand. We baptize those we've taught, those we've led to Christ, not those who don't know him for themselves. So what, is, what did Philip say? Then Philip said, verse 37, if you believe with all your heart, that sounds like Romans 10, 9 and 10 to me, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession unto salvation. Verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Y'all think Scotty was the first one to beam somebody up. I got news for you. Just like that, Philip was gone. Some of us would have been like, but this man said, I don't care what he got. When I got what I came for, I came to worship God and I'm leaving filled with the Holy Ghost. And he went on his way. How did he go? Rejoicing. That's how we want to leave people. When we share the love of God with them, when we share the word of God with them, we teach them who God is, who his son is. We want to leave them in a place where they can rejoice, having confessed Christ for themselves. That's why we do what we do. That's why we go preach the gospel. That's why we teach others, because we want them to be able to have a rejoicing, a joyful relationship with God for themselves. We want them to know Christ for themselves. We want them to be baptized in the because they confess him for themselves. That's what this thing is all about. That's the purpose of the church. If salvation was all God wanted, he'd have snatched you up the moment you got saved. No, salvation is your disposition, praise God. But your commission is to now go replicate what was done in your life and somebody else's life. Your commission your call is to go make disciples do it locally do it regionally do it all over the world well did do some more exploration exploration of that piece of it but for now let's focus on the why why because jesus told us to he commanded us he didn't just suggest it he commissioned us that means he's empowered us and given us the permission and directive, set us apart to go. Decide. So, all who call on him, what do we know about that? Just like this eunuch called upon it, you know, and it's like not lost for, for, on us. The eunuch now is saved. He's on his way back to Ethiopia. What do you think that means? This eunuch brought the gospel to his community. You know, there's many who trace or, or believe they can trace uh, the root of the church in Ethiopia back to this eunuch. The point is, whether he's bought it initially or not, because he came to Jerusalem to worship, that means he had heard about God already. And remember uh, the queen that the Queen of Sheba that visited Solomon many years ago. So we don't know when the gospel first came to the continent of Africa, but we know it was he. The bottom line is, we know uh, God of Eden was here. So we know God walked amongst them even on this land, even before all the other things came to be. So he confessed Christ. That's the point I'm really trying to drive home. And that's significant. Look at Romans chapter 10. Because when we talk about who Christ is, this is our goal, to get somebody to understand him and confess them for himself, themselves. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, of course, tells us how to be saved. But I believe in my mouth and confess, believe in my mouth. <laughs> That too. If I believe in my heart, confess with my mouth, I shall be saved. That's what the word of God says. But look at verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That Ethiopian eunuch called on the name of the Lord. He was saved. That's important to recognize. And, and look at the context of this. When you look at Romans 10, 9, 10, which those of us who counsel, been through altar counseling training, we know that's one of our foundational scriptures that they confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. That's how you have salvation. And this kind of drives the point home, verse 13, because whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let's look at verse 14. Maybe you've never ventured down this way. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? I'm going to call on somebody I never believed in, just like the eunuch. Tell me who this Jesus is that the prophet's talking about. How am I going to know him for myself, preacher? Look at it. And how shall they believe in him of who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How are you going to call on him? How are you going to heal or believe in him or hear about him without somebody telling them about him? Somebody got to tell the story. You didn't just wake up one morning and say, I want to know Jesus. No, you've been salted down with the word by somebody which got you thirsty for Christ. How are they going to know? How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of, in whom they, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Reminds me of that story. <laughs> the little girl was talking to, I think it was in the movie Santa Claus. And she, and, and she said, you must be Santa Claus. He said, no, I'm not Santa Claus. She said, well, how come you have reindeer? He said, lots of people have reindeer. She said, name two. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> Look, I'll wait. How are they going to hear unless they got a preacher? I'm waiting because nobody can understand or know God unless somebody preaches to them. Somebody now in Paul's case, and I believe it's because everybody else was scared of Paul. Saul was running around killing folks. So guess what? Jesus spoke to him directly. Look at Acts chapter nine. Went to him while he was on his donkey. He said, look, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you? And he struck him with blindness. I said, Jesus said, I, I see I ain't got nobody going to witness to him. I'm going to have to do it for myself from heaven. Because they all scared. Is he going to have to do that on your behalf? Because you won't open your mouth and tell somebody. He sent you as his ambassador. How are they going to call on somebody of whom they have not heard? How are they going to hear without a preacher? Somebody got to tell a story. And how shall they preach? Look at verse 15. How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. What does that mean? We commission, or we are commissioned, pardon me, by God and sent to preach the gospel, but we also commission others. You know, does, and I mentioned, I believe, believe this before, how people sold in to support the mission that God had assigned to me because that's biblical. And we send others that they might preach the gospel and share the good news of the gospel, even as we go ourselves. All right. So what happens today? They hear, they believe, they call. When we do what God has called us to do, just like that unit, they hear. He said, who is he talking about? 
Philip sat down and broke it down for him. And he believed in his heart. He said, I believe that Jesus is Lord. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And then he called on the name of the Lord. That means when he confessed, I believe. That's, that's him confessing unto salvation. He got saved. When we made the altar call today, we believe like 26 young folk got up to say yes. How could they answer unless somebody's willing to preach the gospel? Somebody's willing to tell them. Somebody's willing to share the good news. You got neighbors who don't know Jesus and nobody's telling them about him. You got cousins, boo-boo nemen, people down the street, people in D.C., people in Colorado, people in Arkansas, people in Japan, people in Berlin, everywhere you are, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, Georgia, wherever you are, there's somebody that needs to hear the good news. And then there's opportunities for you to go, not just to go lay on the beach in Jamaica. You know, I've never taken a vacation to Jamaica, but I've been there a few times to preach the gospel on missions. Once I went and saw the brokenness, Maybe I'll go back someday just to vacation, but I tell you, it was, it's hard for me to go in there now and not see the brokenness. Once I've seen it, I've seen it. It's hard to go to this elaborate resort knowing that right down the street, I remember being, couldn't have been more than five miles from one of the most glamorous, um, beautiful resort you ever want to see, sitting on a beautiful, Near water beaches of Jamaica. And right down the street, they were living in 10 shacks with no running water, no toilets, so poor they could barely stay alive. Something wrong with that picture. It's hard for me to go over there and just act like everything's normal once I saw it. Anyway. Bottom line is somebody got to tell the story. And when they hear it and they can believe it, then they can accept and call on the name of the Lord for themselves. So what do we know? Jesus gave us a commission. That's really a commandment, a directive. Go make disciples. What do we know? He sent us just as God sent him. What do we know? He told us where to go. And that's everywhere. Your local, your regional, your international communities. Go make disciples. So of course the question is, what is your response? Anybody got a response? I hope your response is here, my Lord, send me. I hope your response is, Father, show me the people right in my midst who need to know you. And then give me the boldness to speak up instead of waiting for somebody else to do it. Amen, Tori. Amen.